Okay, get first thing. What's wrong? What? You did? Yes. Who was it? Terry Gilbert was home alone. She heard some noises at the front door. She sees a shadowy figure walking down the staircase toward her. She aims her gun and fires several shots, and they all hit their target. We called it a homicide. I asked her. Who was this in the basement? When that story was compared with what's at the scene, it didn't match up. So there was some speculation that maybe this is more than just an intruder and a self-defense shooting. Sunday evening, August 18th, 1996. Terry Gilbert was in her home office working when she heard someone enter the home. She called out, but there was no response. Terry panicked, grabbed a loaded 9mm pistol, and ran down to the basement to hide. The intruder followed. She fired three shots at the dark silhouette. When police arrived, they found the body of a man at the bottom of the stairs, lying in a pool of blood. Detectives began to question Terry's story. She knew the intruder and had a clear motive. But was this self-defense or an elaborate plan to commit the perfect murder? Albuquerque is a really interesting town. I bet there's no city quite like it. It's, it's full of grit. It has its share of... Um, warts, has its share of crime, has its share of, of characters, uh, but it also has just a um, almost a magical feel to it. It's a mixture of, of people and culture, a lot of culture, um, coming from Santa Fe, New Mexico, coming from um, the Native American tribes that surround us. It's a good city. Gene Gilbert was the Bernalillo County Commissioner. Um, he was beloved, especially by the veterans community, because he did quite a lot of work for them. His public persona was that of a pretty nice guy, a guy you'd like to have a, a beer with. But he had had an, an ongoing affair for seven years, cheating on his wife, Terry Gilbert. Terry was very intelligent and helped him um, through his career. But they were not a good couple together. She did not like the fact that he was in love with another woman. He was $88,000 in debt. That debt included $15,000 on a credit card they had worked up with his mistress, who, by the way, worked for the Bernalillo County District Attorney's Office. So Terry had kicked him out. Terry Gilbert says alone in her house. She was uh, in, in her office working uh, on uh, some business. And at some point in time, she heard some noises at the front door. She claimed she heard something like a creak or a squeak, shouted, who's there, heard no answer, uh, panicked. She said that she got out of her chair in her small office, ran down the hallway, grabbed the gun out of a drawer, and then ran down to the basement, where she hid, crouched near a water heater. According to Terry, she sees a shadowy figure walking down the staircase toward her. She's afraid. She's a, she thinks, what is this guy going to do? And so to protect herself, she aims her gun in what anyone would say is darkness and fires several shots. And they all hit their target. And the person collapses to the ground. She doesn't know if the person's dead or alive. She runs towards the stairs, which is where the body is, dropping her gun, racing up the stairs to call 911. Number one, get the first thing. What's wrong? Take a deep breath. What's wrong? What? You did? Who was it? He went in your house? Was it a It was about 8.50 at night. It was a Sunday night. It was pretty quiet. A radio dispatch came out. Any unit to respond to a female shooting a burglary suspect. I responded on the radio, said, ah, uh, I was en route, and lights and siren down to the scene. I met the other responding officer with me, Rick Garcia, 
we went out up to the porch area, and the front door was open. The screen door was closed, so you could have you could hear inside. I heard a female uh, crying inside. So we decided to make entry, open the screen door. Our weapons were drawn, and we approached her. And Officer Garcia said, "Where's the body?" She says, "Basement." One word. I asked her, "Where's the gun?" Her response was, "Basement." We went down the first set of stairs, stopped at the landing. It was dark inside. Rick was shining his flashlight around. That was the only illumination we had. I observed a, a male um, at the bottom of the stairs. There's a pool of blood. And it, from my visual, it appeared he was, was deceased. Next to the body, I observed a gun underneath a uh, handkerchief. Our office got immediately involved. The investigator went to the house, and they're the ones who um, actually can pronounce death. We called it a homicide. After they declared him dead, I walked back upstairs and I talked to, to Terry Gilbert. She was um, still crying at times. She would cry and take breaths, a lot of breaths. I asked her, who was this in the basement? At that time, she indicated she did not know. Uh, to the responding uniformed officers, she could not see who it was, so she just shot out of fear. And then after she shot, she scrambled to get upstairs um, so that she could call the police. I, I didn't find that plausible in the course of the investigation. Detectives on the scene start to wonder about Terry's story because Terry had no blood on her clothes, at least none that they saw, none on her feet. Now, how did she walk through pools of blood to run up the stairs and not get blood on her feet. I think the other thing that was of concern is if she doesn't real, realize whether the guy is dead or not, and she still throws her gun down near where this guy's body is laying. If you still think you're threatened by someone that's intruded into your house, why do you throw your weapon down? These are questions that they started to have, and I think there was some justification for those questions. When that story was compared with what's at the scene, um, it, it, didn't, it didn't match up. The man at the bottom of the stairs was Gene Gilbert. And so Terry Gilbert was arrested that night. He owed back taxes to the IRS. He kept pressuring, bullying, his wife to pay off his debt. You start to realize, I guess he's not the great guy we thought he was. News of Jean Gilbert's death topped the Monday morning headlines in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Police had their shooter, Terry Gilbert, in custody. And detectives were putting together their own theory as to why she would want to kill her estranged husband. I uh, was taking my daughter to uh, school, and uh, the district attorney at that point in time, one of his kids was in the same school. He came up to me and said, did you hear what happened? I said, no, what are you talking about? He says, Gene Gilbert's been murdered. That was, that, was a, that was quite a shock. I think people were very shocked to find out that Gene Gilbert had died, number one. Number two, to find out that he'd been killed by Terry Gilbert uh, raised a lot of eyebrows. There, was some speculation that maybe this is more than just an intruder and a self-defense uh, shooting. She was the only witness. And the way it was staged, it was everything she said could have been the way she said it. It just didn't place well with me. You know, how do you shoot someone, step over the body, not get any blood on your feet? She was arrested that night and quickly bonded out, of course and we continue to do our investigation. We all know when we hear somebody walking across the floor, whether they're you know upstairs or they're shuffling through the house, if it's somebody you've lived for 20 plus years, as Terry and, and Jean Gilbert did, you know their walk, you know their shuffle, you know their, just the way they open the door and things of that nature. We did a series of tests. So I had my coworkers who I work with every day walk across the top um, living room. Then this occurred in the basement of the home. 
and they walked across the living room and then came down and we took turns trying to see if we could identify who they were. Um, as she should have with her husband. And I could re easily identify who was coming down the stairs. We were told that um, this man had been shot by his wife and that she apparently thought it was an intruder. So the questions that we were would be asking or looking for was, you know, does this fit with what she said as far as the distance, the range of the, it, uh, the bullets? There were three bullets. What were the angles of those, and does that fit with what she was saying? The casings that were that were located by the crime scene um, investigators were not in the area that she said that um, that she shot from. So the ejections would should be in certain areas, the projectiles or the casings, and they were not there. We recovered all three bullets, and and it, they were consistent and I'm sure they were later tested, but they were certainly consistent with the weapon that she had there. The angles were such that it, it was possible, the way she talked about it, that he was coming down the stairs. Two of them were very close to the same angle, they were, so they were probably shot in very close succession. We do the initial crime scene, and that's just, you know, trying to get trying to get your information of where to go next. And of course, all the, all the neighbors are interviewed. And then, then you interview coworkers, and you interview the wife and the wife's friends, his children. He also had a girlfriend, because we want to formulate an unbiased opinion of what's really going on. And, and the bulk of the people that we interviewed said that you know, the marriage was strife with infidelity, and they, but they stayed together. Uh, my goat was telling me that she, she set him up, she killed him. I mean. She had enough. She had enough of his affairs, and she had enough of his money problems. He owed back taxes to the IRS, to the state of New Mexico, and he had also failed to pay his state uh, sales taxes. He had been trying to get an assistant uh, cabinet-level job in Washington, D.C., with the Veterans Administration. In order to get that, he had to clear up these items with the IRS, because that would have required Senate approval for him to get the job. And with that hanging over his head, there was no way that would have happened. So what he did is he kept pressuring, intimidating, bullying his wife, Terry Gilbert, to try and refinance her home to pay off his debt. Jean Gilbert, who was almost this patron saint of veterans and the county, suddenly all his dirty laundry's being aired, and suddenly you start to realize, well, I guess he's not the great guy we thought he was, or if he was, he hid all those dark things. You know, as you went further on through the investigation, you start pulling up all the police reports, you run an NCIC check, which would pick up any kind of criminal history, arrest, anything like that throughout the country. And it was highly surprising for me that she'd killed her first husband in a similar kind of scenario, um, shot him. And she was cleared of that. She doesn't seem like someone that would shoot her husband, but then you start to wonder, just who is Terry Gilbert? Is there a dark side to her? A woman and her one-year-old son found dead in a park. Now the child's father stands trial for their murders. An ex-Border Patrol agent's life hangs in the balance in this high-stakes death penalty trial. The state alleges a lawsuit over child support was his motive for murder. Core TV cameras will be inside the courtroom capturing every dramatic moment. The Mistress and Child Murder Trial. Live coverage starting Monday morning at 8, 7 central on Court TV. When you the fact that Terry Gilbert had shot and killed her first husband under similar circumstances raised a huge red flag for investigators. And while acquitted of the 1974 shooting, police were now relatively certain that she'd reached a breaking point with Jean, lured him to her home, and murdered him. But could they prove it? As journalists always do, we, we look deeper into the people that are involved in this case. And when we discovered that Terry had also been accused of shooting another husband, um, well, you can imagine, we, we, we knew we needed to get that story out. And uh, uh, we didn't necessarily want to condemn her for that, but we thought that the public needed to know that 
Isn't that interesting? There's two husbands shot dead. My reaction uh, to that was like a lot of other people. Yeah, that sure is a coincidence. Uh, someone uh, shooting a husband twice now in self-defense and killing them. It's an unfortunate through the course of the trial that, that was not allowed to come out. That's extremely disappointing. Because I would, that's, as a juror, if I were a juror, that was the, I would want to know that. She doesn't seem like someone that would shoot her husband. But then you read deeper into what could possibly be motives. You know, here was a woman scorned, basically. Here was a woman who found out that her husband was having a long time affair, who had racked up thousands and thousands of dollars of debt. Um, and who also wanted to, to take her house and use that as a refinancing tool so that he could pay off some of his debts. You know, you start to wonder, just who is Terry Gilbert? Is she this successful uh, businesswoman, which she was, or is there a dark side to her? The way Terry Gilbert was treated in the press was, uh, it, it happens all the time. The uh, news media kind of always presumes people are guilty in uh, high-profile crimes. You know, we they always talk about the uh, uh, presumption of innocence, but when it comes to getting stuff into the paper on the air, quickly that goes off a window. The Terry Gilbert case is a big story, number one, because Jean Gilbert, a Bernalillo County commissioner, uh, a, a champion to veterans, was the murder victim. But I also think it was a case of, um, you know, just this, this, this salacious kind of dirty laundry of these well-known people in the community um, who, um, you know, had really great standing until all this came out. And, and you know, it was a lot to gossip about. I think Terry was charged because Gene Gilbert was a public official and because he was a man. Uh, you have to understand Albuquerque, and it's only 20 some odd years ago, but this is a very small town. This is not a metropolis. This is not New York City or Chicago or Los Angeles. This is a very small place, very parochial place. And you have to understand some of the culture out here too. The idea that a woman uh, could, sh could physically harm a, a man or a husband, that's kind of shocking. So uh, at the time, Terry Gilbert hires two of the most well-known attorneys in the city, uh, Charlie Daniels and his wife, Randy McGinn. And they are a force to be reckoned with. Jean Gilbert had had a long time affair with a uh, member of the district attorney's office here in Bernalillo County. Obviously that means that the district attorney's office has to recuse itself. So they need to request a special prosecutor. So they bring in Randall Harris, who is a district attorney out of the eastern part of New Mexico. Um, he's a kind of a country boy, um, cowboy boot wearing, cowboy looking guy. One of those yes ma'am, yes sir guys. And thought of very highly in the district attorney community of New Mexico. So he's called upon to take this case to court. What we don't know about this case and what we will never know about this case is one, why was Gene Gilbert in that house at 9.48, 9.50 that evening? We don't know. What was he doing in the basement? We have no idea. We don't know. A guy who could tell us probably is Gene, but Gene is dead. I actually felt that the prosecutor was doing a good job. You'll be satisfied that the evidence is plain and clear about what happened down in that basement. His o opening statement was truly horrible. Although their evidence was all circumstantial, the prosecution came to court confident that they could prove this was not self-defense, but a carefully planned murder that the defendant, Terry Gilbert, maliciously devised. This is a criminal case commenced by the state against the defendant, Terry Gilbert. The defendant has been charged with murder in count one and tampering with evidence in count two. Hi, Mr. Harris. This is Eugene Gilbert. He was 49 years old. 
He's one of your county commissioners. He was a Vietnam veteran. He was a father of two from a previous marriage and a stepfather for another. And on August 18th of 1996, this defendant shot and killed him in cold blood in the basement of their home. This trial is about what actually happened, what led up to, and what actually happened down in that basement at the street. Now you're gonna see that the story that she gave to the police is unworthy of belief. And when you listen to the credibility and you listen to this case, credibility, ladies and gentlemen, is a major, major issue. And the credibility of every witness you hear, I ask you to challenge with your own common sense. Just because someone says it from there does not make it true. You judge the credibility, and I ask you to challenge the credibility of every single person who takes that oath. And I'm satisfied if you do that, you'll be satisfied that the evidence is plain and clear about what happened down in that basement. Randall Harris, his o opening statement was was truly hor horrible. There's, there's nothing memorable in it other than that he was sort of studying around, kept telling the jury, we've got circumstantial evidence, and this is hard to do. This is hard to do. What's the jury supposed to think? It was, in my opinion, a very amateurish performance. I actually felt fairly convinced that the prosecutor was doing a good job and, and might very well win the case. As you look at the pieces of this puzzle, it'll all start flowing together as to what exactly happened down there. I thought his folksy demeanor was reaching the jury. And I want to tell you about what happened in the 48 seconds of terror that brought her to this court, because that's all it took. From the time she heard a noise until the time shots were fired, it was 48 seconds. And when somebody breaks into your house, that's about all the time you have. It is that fast you have to make decisions. She did not think this was her husband because he had not been living in the house since the end of January, beginning of February of that year. She had asked him to move out. Six weeks before, she had gotten her key back to the house. Prosecutions left out a lot of facts about what happened. He had bills out the wazoo. You will hear about all of his bills and all of his debts. And that day was supposed to be the day she was going to borrow money on her house that was almost paid off to pay off his debts. Why was she in her house? Was it to threaten her, kill her? That's something we'll never know. What we do know is that he was up to no good. He came in and he had a loaded gun and a prison art handkerchief. When you get to the end of this case, don't rely on just your common sense. Rely on what the evidence shows. And the evidence, ladies and gentlemen, shows this was self-defense. The defense laid out that Gene Gilbert was this bad guy and that he was desperate for Terry Gilbert's money. So desperate that he went over and was somehow going to intimidate her that night. Uh, I got a call over the radio, APD radio, requesting any units to respond to a shooting. A uh, female possibly shot a uh, burglar. And with that information, uh, what, if anything, did you do? Um, respond to the scene. Officer Garcia had arrived before I did. We opened the screen door here, approached inside the house. The defendant was sitting on the couch. She was uh, crying. Now, during that time that you were within a, a foot or so of the defendant, did you notice anything unusual about her? She had a extremely... Uh, clean smell about her. Okay. Not perfumey, but a uh, clean scent as fresh, fresh showered. Her hair was damp, and I saw no blood splatters. I saw no blood on her whatsoever. In the report that you filed that night, you didn't have anything in there about seeing anything that seemed unusually wet or damp or moist or anything like that about her hair, did you? No, I didn't. I didn't uh, mention her hair condition at all. In fact, it wasn't until six months later, as you and the other officers were getting ready for the preliminary hearing, that you first mentioned this belief to anyone. That's correct. And that was when Ms. Gilbert was charged with tampering with evidence by taking a shower with her clothes on and taking her clothes off and putting them in a dryer and changing clothes before the police got there. Do you recall that? I don't recall the circumstances um, which you just explained. 
and it was more than a belief of her hair being damp. I did observe it being damp. But you just never, never told anyone or wrote it down for six months? That That's point. correct, sir. I didn't think her damp hair would was important. Turns out it might have been. Did you hear anything when you were down in that basement? Yes. During the walkthrough? Yes. What was it you heard? Uh, it was a, the dryer that was running over in the corner of the room. Anybody look in the dryer to see if there's any clothing there? Yes. Okay. Did you look in that dryer? Yes. Okay. And what did you find? Uh, there were items of clothing inside the dryer. So their theory of the case was this. Terry Gilbert shoots him. And then she has time to shower in her clothes so that she can get the blood off her clothes, take off her clothes, get a new set of clothes on, put clothes into the dryer, turn on the dryer, then come back up, and then dial 911. The problem with that is that a neighbor heard the shots. And then she said, about five minutes later, she heard the emergency medical people arrive. So does Terry Gilbert have time in five minutes to take a shower with all her clothes on, take those clothes off, redress, run down to the basement stairs, jump over the dead body, put the uh, clothes in the drawer, jump back over the dead body, come upstairs, and dial 911. After taking the statement from Ms. Gilbert, um, I went back to the house, went down in the basement, and that's when I tried to um, recreate or simulate the things that she was telling me that, that she said that had occurred that night. So she said she went over in the back by the water heater. I crouched down in that area, because that's what she told me. And, um, and that's when I, I had people come down um, in this area, to, or down the stairs, so I could see if I could identify the people who were coming down the stairs. I had them shut the lights off as they were getting ready to come down. And um, uh, Joe Foster came down, and I immediately recognized him. Um, I don't see him every day, and I immediately re identified his outline and his body figure. And then when Detective Kenna came down, he was wearing a light colored shirt. And the shirt captured more, even more light, and, uh, and you could see even more. In my opinion, her statement is not factual. What she's saying is not true. You can't see a face. But you can see a silhouette, and you can see a body form, and you can identify who it is. Where the casings were at down here, I, it was inconsistent for me uh, because the casings were on this side, and the gun had a right-hand ejection port. How many inches away from the hot water heater did you position yourself when you got down to look up the stairwell to see what you could see in the dark of people coming and going in the stairs? I, I didn't measure myself to see exactly how, how many inches away I was. Um, I was right near the water heater. You know, you didn't want, I didn't want to get too far out onto the floor. I got near the water heater. You didn't choose the location over here where the cartridges were found, which was within a few feet of the hot water heater, did you? No, because in my opinion, that would have placed me near the dryer or near the washing machine. But I went where she told me she went. All right. You never told her you were going to go back and do an experiment, and you wanted her to tell you exactly which distance and which direction from the water heater she was located, though. No, I did not tell her that. The defense was very good at poking holes in everything that the prosecution brought up, and that included, um, you know, any sort of concern about uh, where exactly Terry was at the bottom of the staircase. In order to do a fair reconstruction, of uh, what happened when she fired, it would be important to ask whether she was crouched or standing by the time she fired the pistol. Isn't that correct? Well, she said she was crouched down, and that's what I used. She said she was crouched down when she went down there to hide. Isn't that correct, Detective Ortiz? Yes. She never said by the time the person came into sight and she yelled out and then fired that she was crouched down at the moment of firing the pistol, did she? No, she did not say she was crouched down at the moment of firing the pistol. What didn't work for the prosecution in this case was their theory of the case of the crime that Terry Gilbert lured Jean into the house that night, lured him into the basement, ambushed him and shot and killed him. They had no evidence to back that up. Absolutely none. I do believe the situation was totally staged. 
Terry Gilbert was very deliberate in what she did. My personal opinion, from a gut and personal feeling, she's a master manipulator. A woman and her one-year-old son found dead in a park. Now the child's father stands trial for their murders. An ex-Border Patrol agent's life hangs in the balance in this high-stakes death penalty trial. The state alleges a lawsuit over child support was his motive for murder. Core TV cameras will be inside the courtroom capturing every dramatic moment. The Mistress and Child Murder Trial. Live coverage starting Monday morning at 8, 7 central on Court TV. The prosecution rested and the defense went with an unexpected tactic. They put the defendant, Terry Gilbert, on the stand to tell her story. It was a gamble and they were going all in. I call your next witness. Call Terry Gilbert to stand. All right. Ms. Gilbert. The defense attorneys made a, a, a big gamble by letting Terry take the stand. But if she's claiming self-defense, you almost have to let the person testify. And I think that defense attorneys had some confidence in knowing that a lot of the negative things about Terry had been not allowed. They were inadmissible. Let me start at the beginning of 1996. And before we open the diary, can you tell the jury what your plans were on January 1 of 1996? In January of 1996, I had reached a point where it was pretty evident that our marriage was not going to be in any way rehabilitated. And I had made a decision that I uh, did not feel it was healthy for me to stay in the relationship with Jean any longer. Did you work during that time to put together your proposal in a formal package for him to sign for um, a divorce or legal separation? Yes. And what happened when you gave the paperwork to him finally for the legal separation? Jean was very angry. Okay. Um, and what did he do to you? Oh, uh, he, he was angry and nasty. He grabbed me. And grabbed you where? He grabbed my arm. The show-stopping thing about this trial, the information that came out, was the fact that the defense painted Jean Gilbert uh, as a lowlife, basically a sleazeball. Are you ready to talk about the evening of August 18th? Yes. OK. Um, have you thought much about what happened that night since it happened? Yes. How often do you think about it? Oh, I think about it every night. OK. And what happens to you when you have to describe it to people. <laughs> For me, it brings back uh, a whole lot of very, very painful feelings. Uh, it's very painful to describe it. Okay. Have you seen, ever seen, the photographs of Gene in the basement after he was no. shot? Have you wanted to see those photographs? No. And why not? I, I don't. I, I don't want to remember Jean that way. Nor I, I just. I don't think I could kill. When you, when you're going through a trial process, you see the dominoes fall. Okay, you're watching stuff happen, and you're like, all right. So they're not going to let the fact that she killed her first husband in. They're not going to let all these little pieces of evidence that you feel are very compelling towards a case. So. You know, on behalf of her defense attorneys, when they get that stuff excluded, your case starts to fall apart. Could you see uh, any features on the person who was coming down the stairs after you? No. Could you see any colors of clothing on the person who was coming down the stairs after you? I didn't see any, no. Um, did you have any awareness of whether the shape was a man or a woman? I knew the shape was big. Okay, and what did you conclude from that, or, or, or did you I have guess, any I, I guess I probably concluded it was a man, but I, because of size more than anything. What else could you tell about the person who was coming down the stairs after you? Nothing. Terry, uh, I thought, made a pretty good witness. Here's this woman alone in the house, and it's dark, and she hears a sound. You could believe that. And I think she was very believable. What happened 
after you said, I've got a gun. He took another step. And then what did you do? I shot. And what was the time, the precise time between the time that you said, I've got a gun, and the time you fired the shot? Or can you say precisely? I can't say precisely. It, it was, a, I don't know, second, uh, it was very short. My personal opinion, um, from a gut and personal feeling, she's a master manipulator. Very good, very smart. That's why Jean kept her available to him, because she was um, just a master planner to help him in his goals to achieve, um, you know, political aspirations. It's almost a silly question, but did you take a shower between the time you shot the man in your basement and the time you called the police? No. Okay. Uh, did you get all wet with all your clothes on and take off all your clothes and put them in the dryer, change clothes, and then run upstairs and call the police? No. They basically portrayed her as uh, a frightened woman, a, a scared woman, an abused woman who, who was in fear of her life. What were you thinking as you crouched in the darkness and heard the man coming across the floor over your head? I was scared to death. I was absolutely scared to death. And when he started coming down the steps? I was terrified. And when he was at the bottom of the steps? It just kept getting worse. In the end, she was a sympathetic witness. Uh, she did not appear to be trying to fool anybody. She wasn't, didn't appear to be playing any roles. She wasn't dressed up fancy. You know, her hair wasn't done. Uh, she looked kind of worn out, in all honesty. Uh, and the stories that she told, and the instances that she related, had the ring of truth to them. Uh, she didn't seem to be faking it. Did you want him dead ever, Terry? No. From the moment the police came to the scene, they made some assumptions that she must be guilty. Has the jury reached a verdict? After Terry Gilbert's powerful testimony, both sides delivered their closing arguments. It came down to Terry's credibility. Did the jury believe her story? Her fate would soon be in their hands. What happened to Terry Gilbert is that virtually from the moment she called 911, she was, she was destined for this courtroom. From the moment the police came to the scene. They made some assumptions that she must be guilty, even before they interviewed her, even before they gave her a chance to hear her story. And you can hear it on the tape. They made the assumption that whatever she was saying had to be looked at as if it were a plan of a murderer, instead of someone telling how she had defended herself. And God help any of you if you ever have to defend yourself, particularly if you are accurate in your shooting because of what has happened to Terry. She acted out of fear, out of understandable human fear. She acted in reasonable self-defense. She had run, she had hidden, she had tried to uh, call for help. She had done everything a human possibly could do until she, her back to the was to the wall. But she, she, she was not guilty by reason of self-defense. I trust that will be your verdict. Thank you. We proceed. You know, folks, in order to believe this self-defense claim, you basically, you don't have to use your common sense. You don't have to use your reason. It was unusual. I noticed that as I heard Mr. Daniels talk to you, I never once heard him say to you, please use your common sense. Please use reason. Please use your life experiences. What I heard him say was, you can trust my client. You can trust what she tells you about Jean Gilbert and about everything. The circumstantial evidence in this case is the last voice that Jean Gilbert has. And the circumstantial evidence in this case is loud and it's clear that Jean Gilbert did not do what he's accused of. And more than that, the state has met its burden of proof that this 
victim, Team Gilbert, was lured into that house, into that basement, those lights were on, and that when he was lured in there, he was shot and killed. And that's what the circumstantial evidence is, period. Well, it's always hard to read a jury, but I felt that Randall Harris had a strong chance of finding or getting a jury to find Terry Gilbert guilty. I thought you would be convicted because you got a high profile public official and sometimes, you know, in, in my experience, some juries do give a little more weight to the prosecution. Uh, part of my judgment was clouded simply because, of course, I knew that she had killed her first husband. The jury didn't know that. Please be seated. Has the jury reached a verdict? All right, the verdicts are in the proper order. Omitting the caption, we find the defendant, Terry Gilbert, not guilty as charged in count one. Oh. Verdict, we find the defendant, Terry Gilbert, not guilty of tampering with evidence as charged in count two. When the verdict came and it was not guilty on all counts for Terry Gilbert, she lets out this sort of cry, I guess you would call it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. I'd like to just just a moment, just a moment. Take it easy. This this audible sound of relief as if everything pent up was just being released. I'm relieved. Oh and very thankful that the jury took the time to look at everything. I, I feel very lucky that I had a jury that did that. You're hurt and you're shocked, but you always, you're like, damn, I knew it. I knew it, you know, because you lose all your little pieces of evidence along the way. It's not a matter of her beating the criminal justice system. She just played the criminal justice system the way it works. The burden of proof for the state is, is incredible. This case, you know, was one of the few cases in my many years of law enforcement that resulted in acquittal. And um, that's difficult to swallow. We did get to talk to the jury after the verdict. That was, in a way, that was set up by the judge. He told them that this was a high-profile case, that the public is going to want to know, why did you acquit this lady? Uh, so uh, they were ready for us. After talking to them, it's clear they very methodically went through everything and um, just didn't agree with the way the prosecution said the facts fit. And they just came out flat and said it. No, they did not have any evidence to support their theory of the case. I don't know that I will ever completely believe Terry Gilbert's version of the story. There were just too many things that we know that happened that make it very suspicious. In my opinion, she has gotten away with murder twice, absolutely. I can only speculate, and I, I think that she laid in wait. She had enough. The court of law does not agree. So it's all, that is my personal opinion. You know, a lot of people ask, uh, whatever happened to Terry Gilbert? My answer is, I have no idea. If I were her, I would have moved somewhere and changed my name. I'm guessing that's probably what happened. That would be my hunch. Months after the trial, Terry Gilbert changed her name to Terry Odenian. She died September 19th, 2020 in Port Hardy, British Columbia. She was 73 years old. I'm Tamron Hall. Thank you for watching Someone They Knew.